a Wikividi Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Elizabeth Taylor Dame Elizabeth Rosemond, Liz, Taylor, was a British-American actress, businesswoman, and humanitarian. She began her career as a child actress in the early 1940s, and was one of the most popular stars of classical Hollywood cinema in the 1950s. She continued her career successfully into the 1960s, and remained a well-known public figure for the rest of her life. In 1999, the American Film Institute named her the seventh greatest female screen legend. Born in London to wealthy, socially prominent American parents, Taylor moved with her family to Los Angeles in 1939, and she soon was given a film contract by Universal Pictures. She made her screen debut in a minor role in There's One Born Every Minute, but Universal terminated her contract after a year. Taylor was then signed by Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, and had her breakthrough role in National Velvet, becoming one of the studio's most popular teenage stars. She made the transition to adult roles in the early 1950s, when she starred in the comedy Father of the Bride and received critical acclaim for her performance in the drama A Place in the Sun. Despite being one of MGM's most bankable stars, Taylor wished to end her career in the early 1950s, as she resented the studio's control, and disliked many of the films to which she was assigned. She began receiving roles she enjoyed more in the mid-1950s, beginning with the epic drama giant and starred in several critically and commercially successful films in the following years. These included two film adaptations of plays by Tennessee Williams, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, and Suddenly, Last Summer, Taylor won a Golden Globe for Best Actress for the latter. Although she disliked her role as a call girl in Butterfield 8, her last film for Emgem, she won the Academy Award for Best Actress for her performance. Taylor was then paid a record-breaking $1 million to play the title role in the historic Aleppo Cleopatra, the most expensive film made up to that point. During the filming, Taylor and co-star Richard Burton began an extramarital affair, which caused a scandal. Despite public disapproval, Burton and she continued their relationship, and were married in 1964, dubbed, Liz, and Dick, by the media. They starred in 11 films together including The V.I.P.S., The Sandpiper, The Taming of the Shrew, and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Taylor received the best reviews of her career for Woolf, winning her second Academy Award, and several other awards for her performance. She and Burton divorced in 1974, but reconciled soon after, and remarried in 1975. The second marriage ended in divorce in 1976. Taylor's acting career began to decline in the late 1960s, Although she continued starring in films until the mid-1970s, after which she focused on supporting the career of her sixth husband, Senator John Warner. In the 1980s, she acted in her first substantial stage roles and in several television films and series, and became the first celebrity to launch a perfume brand. Taylor was also one of the first celebrities to take part in HIV-AIDS activism. She co-founded the American Foundation for AIDS Research in 1985, and the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation in 1991. From the early 1990s until her death, she dedicated her time to philanthropy. She received several accolades for it, including the Presidential Citizens Medal. Throughout her life, Taylor's personal affairs were subject to constant media attention. She was married eight times to seven men, endured serious illnesses, and led a jet-set lifestyle, including assembling one of the most expensive private collections of jewelry. After many years of ill health, Taylor died from congestive heart failure at the age of 79 in 2011. Early Life Elizabeth Rosemond Taylor was born on February 27, 1932, at Heathwood, her family's home on a Twildwood Road in Hampstead Garden suburb, London. She received dual British-American citizenship at birth, as her parents, art dealer Frances Len Taylor and retired stage actress Sarah Southern were United States citizens, both originally from Arkansas City, Kansas. They moved to London in 1929, and opened an art gallery on Bond Street. Their first child, a son named Howard, was born the same year. The family led a privileged life in London during Taylor's childhood. Their social circle included artists such as Augustus John and Laura Knight, and politicians such as Colonel Victor Cazalet. Cazalet was Taylor's unofficial godfather, and an important influence in her early life. 
she was enrolled in Byron House, a Montessori school in Highgate, and was raised according to the teachings of Christian science, the religion of her mother and Cazalet. The Taylors decided to return to the United States in the spring of 1939 due to the increasingly tense political situation in Europe. American Ambassador Joseph P. Kennedy also contacted Francis, and encouraged him to return to the U.S. with his family, Sarah, and the children left first in April 1939, and moved in with Taylor's maternal grandfather in Pasadena, California. Francis stayed behind to close the London Gallery, and joined them in December. In early 1940, he opened a new gallery in Los Angeles, and after briefly living in Pacific Palisades, the family settled in Beverly Hills, where Taylor and her brother were enrolled in Hawthorne School. Early Roles in Teenage Stardom 1941-1949 In California, Taylor's mother was frequently told that her daughter should audition for films. Taylor's eyes in particular drew attention. They were blue to the extent of appearing violet, and were rimmed by dark double eyelashes, caused by a genetic mutation. Sarah was initially opposed to Taylor appearing in films, but after the outbreak of war in Europe made return there unlikely, she began to view the film industry as a way of assimilating to American society. Frances Taylor's Beverly Hills Gallery had gained clients from the film industry soon after opening, helped by the endorsement of gossip columnist Hedda Hopper, a friend of the Cazalets. Through a client and a school friend's father, Taylor auditioned for both Universal Pictures and Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer early 1941. Both studios offered Taylor contracts, and Sarah Taylor chose to accept Universal's offer. Taylor began her contract in April 1941, and was cast in a small role in There's One Born Every Minute. She did not receive other roles, and her contract was terminated after a year. Universal's casting director explained her dislike of Taylor, stating that, the kid has nothing. Her eyes are too old. She doesn't have the face of a child. Biographer Alexander Walker agrees that Taylor looked different from the child stars of the era, such as Shirley Temple and Judy Garland, and she herself later explained that, apparently, I used to frighten grown-ups, because I was totally direct. Taylor received another opportunity in late 1942, when her father's acquaintance, MGM producer Samuel Marx, arranged her to audition for a minor role requiring an actress with an English accent in Lassie Come Home. After a trial contract of three months, she was given a standard seven-year contract in January 1943. Following Lassie, she appeared in minor uncredited roles in two other films set in England Jane Eyre and The White Cliffs of Dover. Taylor was cast in her first starring role at the age of 12 when she was chosen to play a girl who wants to compete in the exclusively male Grand National in National Velvet. She later called it, the most exciting film, of her career. Emjim had been looking for a suitable actress with a British accent and the ability to ride horses since 1937, and chose Taylor, at the recommendation of Whitecliffe's director Clarence Brown, who knew she had the required skills, as she was deemed too short. Filming was pushed back several months to allow her to grow she spent the time practicing riding. In developing her into a new star, Emjim required her to wear braces to correct her teeth, and had two of her baby teeth pulled out. The studio also wanted to dye her hair, and change the shape of her eyebrows, and proposed that she use the screen name, Virginia, but Taylor and her parents refused. National Velvet became a box office success upon its release on Christmas 1944. Bosley Crowther of the New York Times stated that, her whole manner in this picture is one of refreshing grace, while James Agee of The Nation wrote that she, is rapturously beautiful. I hardly know or care whether she can act or not. Taylor later stated that her childhood ended when she became a star, as Emjim started to control every aspect of her life. She described the studio as a, big extended factory, where she was required to adhere to a strict daily schedule. Days were spent attending school and filming at the studio lot, and evenings in dancing and singing classes, and in practicing the following day's scenes. Following the success of National Velvet, Emjim gave Taylor a new seven-year contract, with a weekly salary of $750, and cast her in a minor role in the third film of the Lassie series, Courage of Lassie. The studio also published a book of Taylor's writings about her pet chipmunk, Nibbles and Me 
and had paper dolls and coloring books made after her. When Taylor turned 15 in 1947, Emjim began to cultivate a more mature public image for her by organizing photo shoots and interviews which portrayed her as a normal teenager attending parties and going on dates. Film magazines and gossip columnists also began comparing her to older actresses such as Ava Gardner and Lana Turner. Life called her Hollywood's most accomplished junior actress for her two film roles that year. In the critically panned Cynthia, she portrayed a frail girl who defies her overprotective parents to go to the prom, and the love interest of a stockbroker's son in the period film Life with Father, opposite William Powell and Irene Dunn. They were followed by supporting roles as a teenaged man stealer who seduces her peers' date to a high school dance in the musical A Date with Judy and as a bride in the romantic comedy Julia Misbehaves, which became a commercial success by grossing over $4 million in the box office. Taylor's last adolescent role was as Amy March in Mervyn Leroy's Little Women. While it did not match the popularity of the previous 1933 film adaptation of Louisa M. Alcott's novel, it was a box office success. The same year, Time featured Taylor on its cover, and called her the leader among Hollywood's next generation of stars, a jewel of great price. A true sapphire. Transition to adult trolls, 1950-1951. Taylor made the transition to adult trolls in 1950, the year she turned 18. Her first mature role was playing a woman who begins to suspect that her husband is a Soviet spy in the thriller Conspirator. Taylor had been only 16 at the time of its filming. But its release was delayed until March 1950, as Emjim disliked it and feared it could cause diplomatic problems. Taylor's second film of 1950 was the comedy The Big Hangover, co-starring Van Johnson. It was released in May, and the same month, Taylor married hotel chain Air Conrad Hilton Jr. in a highly publicized ceremony. The event was organized by Emjim and used as part of the publicity campaign for Taylor's next film, Vincente Minnelli's comedy Father of the Bride in which she appeared opposite Spencer Tracy and Joan Bennett as a bride preparing for her wedding. The film became a box office success upon its release in June, grossing $6 million worldwide, and was followed by a successful sequel, Father's Little Dividend. Ten months later, Taylor's next film release, George Stevens' A Place in the Sun, marked a departure from her earlier films. According to Taylor, it was the first film in which she had been asked to act, instead of simply being herself. And it brought her critical acclaim for the first time since National Velvet. Based on Theodore Rice's novel An American Tragedy, it featured Taylor as a spoiled socialite who comes between a poor factory worker and his pregnant girlfriend. Stevens cast Taylor as she was the only one who could create this illusion of being not so much a real girl as the girl on the candy box cover. The beautiful girl in the yellow Cadillac convertible that every American boy sometime or other thinks he can marry. A Place in the Sun was a critical and commercial success, grossing $3 million. Herb Golden of Variety stated that Taylor's histrionics are of a quality so far beyond anything she has done previously, that Stevens' skilled hands on the reins must be credited with a minor miracle, and A. H. Wyler of the New York Times wrote that she gives a shaded, tender performance and one in which her passionate and genuine romance avoids the pathos common to young love as it sometimes comes to the screen. Continued success at Hemjim, 1952-1955. Taylor next starred in the romantic comedy Love is Better Than Ever. According to Alexander Walker, Hemjim cast her in the B picture as a reprimand for divorcing Hilton in January 1951 after only nine months of marriage which had caused a public scandal that reflected negatively on her. After completing Love is Better Than Ever, Taylor was sent to Britain to take part in the historic Epoch Ivanhoe, which was one of the most expensive projects in the studio's history. She was not happy about the project, finding the story superficial and her role as Rebecca too small. Regardless, Ivanhoe became one of MGM's biggest commercial successes, earning $11 million in worldwide rentals. Taylor's last film made under her old contract with Engine was The Girl Who Had Everything, a remake of the pre-code drama A Free Soul. Despite her grievances with the studio, she signed a new seven-year contract with Engine in the summer of 1952. Although she wanted more interesting roles, the decisive factor in continuing 
with the studio was her financial need. She had recently married British actor Michael Wilding, and was pregnant with her first child. In addition to granting her a weekly salary of $4,700, Emjim agreed to give the couple a loan for a house, and sign Wilding for a three-year contract. Due to her financial dependency, the studio now had even more control over her than previously. Taylor's first two films made under her new contract were released ten days apart in spring 1954. The first was Rhapsody, a romantic film starring her as a woman caught in a love triangle with two musicians. The second was Elephant Walk, a drama in which she played a British woman struggling to adapt to life on her husband's tea plantation in Ceylon. She had been loaned to Paramount Pictures for the film after its original star, Vivian Lee, fell ill. In the fall, Taylor starred in two more film releases. Bo Brahma was a Regency-era period film, another project in which she was cast against her will. Taylor disliked historical films in general, as their elaborate costumes and makeup required her to wake up earlier than usual to prepare, and later stated that she gave one of the worst performances of her career in Bo Brummel. The second film was Richard Brooks's The Last Time I Say or Paris, based on F. Scott Fitzgerald's short story. Although she had instead wanted to be cast in The Barefoot Contessa, Taylor liked the film, and later stated that it convinced me I wanted to be an actress instead of yawning my way through parts. While the last time I saw Paris was not as profitable as many other Emjim films, it garnered positive reviews. Taylor became pregnant again during the production, and had to agree to add another year to her contract to make up for the period spent on maternity leave. Critical acclaim, 1956-1960 By the mid-1950s, the American film industry was beginning to face serious competition from television, which resulted in studios producing fewer films, and focusing instead on their quality. The change benefited Taylor, who finally found interesting roles after several years of career disappointments. After lobbying director George Stevens, she won the female lead role in Giant an epic drama about a ranching dynasty, which co-starred Rock Hudson and James Dean. Its filming in Marfa, Texas, was a difficult experience for Taylor, as she clashed with Stevens, who wanted to break her will to make her easier to direct, and was often ill, resulting in delays. To further complicate the production, Dean died in a car accident only days after completing filming, grieving Taylor still had to film reaction shots to their joint scenes. When Giant was released a year later, it became a box office success, and was widely praised by critics. Although not nominated for an Academy Award like her co-stars, Taylor's performance also garnered positive reviews, with Variety calling it, surprisingly clever, and the Manchester Guardian lauded it as, an astonishing revelation of unsuspected gifts, and named her one of the film's strongest assets. Emjim next reunited Taylor with Montgomery Clift in Raintree County, a Civil War drama it hoped would replicate the success of Gone with the Wind. Taylor found her role as a mentally disturbed Southern Belle fascinating, but overall disliked the film. Although the film failed to become the type of success Emjim had planned, Taylor was nominated for the first time for an Academy Award for Best Actress for her performance. Taylor considered her next performance as Maggie the Cat in the screen adaptation of the Tennessee Williams play Cat on a Hot Tin Roof a career high point, although it coincided with one of the most difficult periods in her personal life. After completing Raintree Country, she had divorced Wilding and married producer Mike Todd. She had completed only two weeks of filming in March 1958 when Todd was killed in a plane crash. Although she was devastated, pressure from the studio and the knowledge that Todd had large debts led Taylor to return to work only three weeks later. She later stated that she, in a way, became Maggie, and that acting was the only time I could function in the weeks after Todd's death. During the production, Taylor's personal life drew further public attention when she began an affair with singer Eddie Fisher whose marriage to actress Debbie Reynolds had been idealized by the media as the union of America's sweethearts. The affair and Fisher's subsequent divorce changed Taylor's public image from a grieving widow to a homewrecker. Emjim used the scandal to its advantage by featuring an image of Taylor posing on a bed in a negligee in the film's promotional posters. Catch grossed $10 million in American cinemas alone, and made Taylor the year's second most profitable star.
She received positive reviews for her performance, with Bosley Crowther of the New York Times calling her terrific and Variety praising her for a well-accented, perceptive interpretation. Taylor was nominated for an Academy Award and a BAFTA. Taylor's next film, Joseph L. Mankiewicz Suddenly, last summer, was another Tennessee Williams adaptation, and co-starred Montgomery Clift and Katherine Hepburn. The independent production earned Taylor $500,000 for playing the role of a severely traumatized patient in a mental institution. Although the film was a drama about mental illness, childhood traumas, and homosexuality, it was again promoted with Taylor's sex appeal. Both its trailer and poster featured her in a white swimsuit. The strategy worked, as the film became a financial success. Taylor received her third Academy Award nomination and her first Golden Globe for Best Actress for her performance. By 1959, Taylor wrote one more film for Amgen, which it decided should be Butterfield 8, a drama about a high-class prostitute. The studio correctly calculated that Taylor's public image would make it easy for audiences to associate her with the role. She hating the film for the same reason, but had no choice in the matter, although the studio agreed to her demands of filming in New York and casting Eddie Fisher in a sympathetic role. As predicted, Butterfield 8 was a major commercial success, grossing $18 million in world rentals. Crowther wrote that Taylor, looks like a million dollars, in mink or in negligee. While Variety stated that she gives, a torrid, stinging portrayal with one or two brilliantly executed passages within, Taylor won her first Academy Award for Best Actress for her performance. Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries. Would you 